He who travels to be amused to get something which he does not carry travels away from himself and grows old even in youth among old things. He carries ruins to ruins. Traveling is a fool's paradise. Our first journeys discover to us the indifference of places. At home, I dream that at Naples, at Rome, I can be intoxicated with beauty and lose my sadness. I pack my trunk, embrace my friends, embark on the sea, and at last wake up in Naples. And there beside me is the stern fact, the sad self, unrelenting, identical that I fled from. I seek the Vatican and the palaces. I affect to be intoxicated with sights and suggestions, but I am not intoxicated. My giant goes with me wherever I go. Hi, and welcome to Fool's Paradise. I'm Samuel Webster. Today's episode is really special for me, but also new and different from everything else we've talked about. Because... Until this point, we've been working consistently with people who I knew very little or about things that I didn't know anything about. And and that's always interesting, you know. We're introducing people to a new topic and I'm learning and we can sort of learn it together. Today, well, today I'm already nervous (laughs) because I'm in a studio that is like, you know, way more professional than my standard one. And... I've just met in the last few days someone whose voice I've heard in my head for 12 years. The devil. (laughs) Well, (laughs) well, longer than 12 years with him. (laughs) And it's a strange thing because you meet someone and you know so much about them. This is someone that I know, well, we will talk about how much I know, but I feel like I know her whole life. I feel like I've seen the ups and downs and the changes over 12 years and in a sense, I've grown because I was 20 when I started this thing. You know, in 20, it's a period of trying to figure out who you are. And also, uh, it's an, a special episode because this is our first episode in New York. Mm-hmm. And my experience of New York was completely shaped around hearing these voices five days a week in my headphones. This is a person that even though I had no prior connection, when I released my first book, I felt like I needed to send it to her. I, I, I don't even know why. I, just, I kind of said, you've been in my head for so long that finally when I have something to show for it, I wanted you to see it. So you can see why I'm nervous. You can see why I'm excited. You can see why this is an important person to me. <laughs> and if you say negative comments, I'm not going to read them. <laughs> Without further ado, I'm actually going to ask her uh, if she'll introduce herself. So who are you, Mr. Geth? <laughs> My name is Chemda. I believe you're talking about the Keith and the Girl show, which I play the girl in. Uh, and I play the girl in my life as well. Uh, I know we just spoke about that you're going to ask me who I am. And right away, I'm just like, I don't fucking know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that's the biggest question you can ask me. Sure. And then I thought of Duh, that's why I want to tattoo a question mark on my arm. Uh, I am, I am ever changing. You know, I, I know that that question will only, I can only answer it in this like spacey mind space, you know. Well, what if I change the question? Okay. <laughs> Who do people think you are? Um, let's see. I think with a name like Chemda, uh, in America, there's always like a slight foreigner thing. Um, with a face like mine, there's always a where you're from. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm from the Middle East, but I get a lot of Mediterranean, Italian, you know. And um, if my parents are, I think, I think I'm think i different to everybody. My parents would think I'm a rebel. Mm-hmm. And other people would think I'm a puss. <laughs> so <laughs> it's very interesting. And I'm learning a lot about perspective. So I, I think I am... Uh, Right here, right now, the girl from the Keith and the Girl show. Okay. Right? Because that, that was most of my introduction. Sure. <laughs> and that is how you know me. So This is true. In this context, I think I'm that. Do you think it's... So let's... We have we have met. So I ordinarily maybe would have recorded an episode immediately after meeting you mm. and saying, we don't know each other, but it's fine. Don't worry about it. I'm it's super fun. Ask, you know? Yeah. And well, it's for me, it's like, I love putting a microphone in someone's face and asking them a question because they have this so, like nervous thing where they 
don't really know what they're going to do if it's silent. So they come up with something. That's and you true. always find interesting things. And I've had people say, cut, cut, cut. You're going to have to cut all that, you know, because they're, they're honest, but they don't know how they're expressing themselves. Right. It's very strange to talk into a microphone because it feels like you're talking to a microphone. Sure. Yeah. And that separation sometimes makes you tell the truth or makes you exaggerate the truth to feel like you're lying or something. It's very strange. Yeah. To be special. Yeah. It's amplifying your life. It's amplifying the things both physically and emotionally. So- what effect do you think it's had on you five days a week for twelve for almost 13 years having a microphone in your face and being asked to express something? Oof. Um, so I've had to, <laughs> this is so funny because as I think about it, I'm like, well, I have to be concise. Mm-hmm. I'm just like, well, I'm already not concise <laughs> <laughs> to, to give you the long answer for that. But um, I, I do have to try to get to the heart of it. Uh, I do have to let go that you have 12 years of my experience. So if you go back 10 years ago, um, I probably am a different person. I have to accept that I'm a different person and not like beat myself up about it, that I now have different opinions and people can go back and hear my old, sometimes very antiquated opinions where I thought I was being progressive. Sometimes I was being progressive and now we move as a culture, as a society into a different space and now I sound ignorant. Mm. And also... People ask me or I ask people and we bring up topics that are so serious and I joke about them. I joke about rape. I joke about assault. I joke about my own insecurities and it's a vulnerability that I've come to very much enjoy that I try to do off mic now as well. So when I try to not have stupid casual conversations with people unless that's what we need in order to have a catalyst to get to a real conversation because I really feel like Everyone's thirsty for that, including me, especially me. Mm. So has your personality changed in that you are more likely to express your true opinion in in any place that you end up in? That's so funny because I always thought I was saying my opinion, you know, and then the layers start, you know, uncovering where you start realizing some of the stuff is not as black and white as Mm. you thought initially. Some of the stuff is you were so adamant or I was so adamant about, you know, being an outspoken woman, an outspoken Middle Eastern woman, um, just a, a person, don't even call me a woman, you know, um, I just want to be treated equally. Am I treated, being treated equally? All of that has to go away and it doesn't matter. I'm just going to speak. And through me speaking over 12 years, I've discovered that I don't really feel the way that I speak sometimes and I have to apologize to myself and other people. I've discovered that... um It is so much easier to just tell people the embarrassing things because they become automatically less embarrassing and people, no matter how embarrassing or how vulnerable your thing is that you're saying, somebody else is going to connect to it and it's sort of, it always takes the sting away. So I really think that I can be in front of anybody and they can ask me anything. Like when people go, can I ask you a personal question? Yes, 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 yes. can't think of a question that somebody can't ask me that if you're really, you know, if you have good intention, I will sit there with you and I'll love it. But does some of that come out of the fact that almost everything has been talked about in your life? Uh, Yeah. Like, what do you mean? Well, you've put out, so Keith and the Girl, for those don't, who don't know, is a long, very long running podcast, one of the longest running podcasts, and you have over 3,000 episodes? How Almost 3,000. Almost yeah. 3,000. I think with, with other shows included on our network, we definitely have over 3,000. Sure. <laughs> so if you're thinking of each of those as an hour of content minimum, mm-hmm. because I know there are some that are much, much longer, there comes a point where you've really expressed a lot of your own personality, your own opinions, and maybe a lot of what what you could call dirty laundry in a sense of, of the intimate things that people could ask. You could almost say, well, episode 645, go there and I'm going to go have a coffee. And people are afraid to say things like that to me, like how you said, we just met, but you know, my whole life, I accept that. Mm. And I think we should go from there. And you can say things like in episode 645, when you talked about your abortion or something like that. And then, you know, because I do meet people who listen to the show and they will say things like, I don't know how to start speaking to you because sure. I want to I want to reference shows. And I say, then reference shows. Yeah. Because I would love for my parents to know me this well. I would love for um, everybody to start from this place where it's, 
who cares what you know about me? You know, let's not pretend like you don't. Let's let's not pretend like I didn't tell you how I like to have sex or who I'm having sex with or when I cried after sex mm. or whatever it is. But does that make you feel vulnerable that you give that intimacy to so many people? I love it. Okay. I love it. And I think, you know, vulnerability is a beautiful thing. And I think especially in America, um, we ju- we take it as like a negative thing. Like I'm feeling small, I'm feeling nervous, and maybe I'm feeling some of that, but I don't feel small anymore when I'm feeling vulnerable. I'm mm. feeling... Um, I'm feeling normal now, but it also, <laughs> so the, the weird side of this is when talking to normal people, I sometimes, normal people, <laughs> <laughs> so are they people, people that don't talk with thousands of people on microphone every day. Well, people who don't know that I do that. I now, I, I call them normal because I get treated like I'm not normal sometimes. Sure. And I, I have to remember that other people's gauge doesn't start where I start. They don't start with, you know, intimate details of their life. They mm. start with the weather. And I tend yeah. to cut through that into, and hey, I'm did you same. have a tumor also? You know, like. <laughs> sure. Well, I'm the same. Spoiler on the tumor. We haven't, <laughs> we're not there yet. I'm, I'm the same even um, outside of the podcasting. I was talking to. Shout out to Andrea Allen and Hot Mess Comedy Hour. Hell yeah. Uh, I was talking to Andrea yesterday and I said, I think one, like the real measure of growing up, the real measure of adulthood is getting to the point where you realize that you are who you are and people aren't going to like you for that and just doing it anyway. Isn't that funny that the biggest lessons are the corniest? Absolutely. The, the ones that we learned in kindergarten. Sure. But we, but we learned them in kindergarten while they're kind of saying, yeah, but not like that right that's the tough part it's like be who you are as long as it's one of these three things exactly so i kind of i remember even a few months ago having a conversation with someone and i i don't know i asked a question about sex or something and she said oh i i don't i don't like talking about that kind of stuff and i'm like but okay fine like i understand if we don't have the relationship fine if you think whatever but the idea that the entire topic is is off the table yes and that that I think we have to be sensitive to because sex has been has been changed for people by by people just being attacked with it. So you know what I mean that uh, there are certain vulnerability vulnerabilities for other people that I have to mind because I have talked about sexual assault that's been done on me. I have talked about you know uh, lines that people have crossed with me, and so I've become comfortable with that. But to a lot of people, that's a trigger. That's something that they still need to work through. And because I've spoken on air for 12 years, I've worked through a lot of that stuff. But you can't really, this is what I learned, just because I can see people's vulnerabilities, it doesn't mean that I should bring them up. It doesn't mean that they're even ready sure. for it because I can, Yeah, that's not fair. No, I think it, yeah, it's a, it is about respect. I think I just, I get, it's almost like I get shocked when I'm around people that, that have these kind of taboos in their life. And I don't know what that is because I, I don't think I'm particularly progressive in that I'm, I don't walk around talking about all this stuff. But if it comes up, I just kind of go with it. Right. Maybe not. Ever, maybe they, there are normal people and then there's everyone else. <laughs> well, I've, I've learned to speak from the me perspective and to read the room a little bit more sure. and to read the room in a different way because I could read the room. You can tell me, actually, there's there's a feeling of somebody wants to talk about something, but maybe I need to know better that they're not ready. Yeah. You know, because maybe they're ready on a normal scale and I'll so, take it too far. And they're not in a therapy session. We're at a party. Sure. So they might not want to yeah. go that far. Well, that's a mistake I've made a number of <laughs> yeah. times. Yeah. And that's not fair. And I take that upon myself. And I, I've had to stop doing that, mm. even though it was encouraged and seen from me as a nice person. I just helped that person walk through something. Sure. We had a moment. I was definitely there with them. I was, you know, um, empathetic and sympathetic to everything, but that doesn't mean that that's what they wanted their night to be. And even though they got something out of it or whatever, it's, it's not really right to choose that moment for other people. We, yeah. Well, in fact, for, for many years, I had people saying, whenever I was depressed, they're saying, well, you know, have you been to get, some drugs or have you been to take something mm. yeah, and I pushed it so far it's like no no you know because I was so scared of it taking all of my creative ability so scared and I pushed it and pushed it and I'm and I know that they were thinking of me 
Like right. it's no one wants to put people on pills. Like it's not. It's just not a thing. They, they I wouldn't would, say no one, but we're talking semantics. Sure, now and I'm getting too <laughs> well, friends necessarily. <laughs> right. You know, shouldn't. everyone's well intentioned. Sure, yeah. <laughs> and so and and I pushed and pushed until I got to the point one day where I was like, I can't do this anymore whatsoever, and it just I had to choose. I had to choose to try it, and I was like, I'll try it. If it doesn't work, we can always stop. It's all good. It's pretty scary. And now it's a year that I've taken, and I feel a lot better. Oh, cool. Surprisingly, and I didn't lose any of the things that I was scared of losing. And and it was the first thing they said to me when I walked in. They said, the drugs are a lot better now, and they don't affect all of your senses. Mm. They don't affect everything. They they affect the, the one that you've got a problem with, which for me is serotonin. So they said, well, it just changes your serotonin, and you're fine. And you only, you didn't have to, because a lot of people have to go from one of these kinds of met from Wellbutrin to, um, uh, I could probably name a bunch because my husband yeah. is on like two of the, oh, it's a mm. Zoloft and, you know, kind of mix and match a little bit. You just. No, I just, because I take um, paroxetine, which is, is just about um, balancing your serotonin levels. Mm. So, you know, even Zoloft and these other things, which have a, even like they kind of have a sleeping pill effect, which can, you know, really drag you down i get a little bit of that side effect but i i really just feel like it chemically balances me i i've had lows and i feel low but i don't feel like i can't get out of bed and i was at the point and i've and i haven't lost anything else so i was really surprised i was really surprised that i didn't have to change three or four times to figure out what works for me just took it and it went i do feel like that's one of the exhausting things because you're already going through it and you're so you got really lucky yeah that's really cool and i i worry sometimes about having it like sometimes i'll skip it for two days by accident because mm-hmm. i'm tra- like i for example coming to new york i with the time zone difference i skipped it before i left by accident then i got to new york and the times changed and it kind of worked out that i skipped it for two days and there's a certain feeling of sickness that i have when i don't take it and that worries me because i'm like my body is saying, you know, that you're having withdrawal and you don't have this thing in your system. Maybe it's not such a great thing. It depends. I mean, I'm not a doctor, but sometimes there's withdrawals for a certain number, you know, like maybe three to seven days or a month or something. And, you know, there's withdrawals from heroin and sure. I don't want to compare your, <laughs> your stuff to heroin. But <laughs> Well, but I am on heroin as well. <laughs> but you're okay on the other side is what I'm trying yeah, to say. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's the thing. So I'm, part of it is like when I don't take it, I realize the effect that it's having on my body. By the by, the sense of withdrawal that I've got, but it works. So as as long as it keeps working, you know, until I get really paranoid about mm-hmm. the chemicals, mm-hmm. I'm gonna go ahead. Um, I'm I'm interested to know. In a, in a sense, so okay, so this is the thing that's weird to me. In this experience, right? I've heard your voice, so, so many times. And as much, and you know, this is going to sound like an insult, but it's not. <laughs> um, I've fallen asleep mm-hmm. to your show, which is which is really like that sounds like it's boring, and it's not. It's actually that my brain is is so hyperactive all day that if I don't focus on one thing, I can't sleep. So I understand that. I've watched Bitch in Apartment Twenty Three. A billion times. And I've watched it to go to sleep. <laughs> sure. Which it's one of my favorite shows of all time, mm. but I'm comforted by it. Sure. I'm comforted by knowing what's coming, knowing the characters, and falling asleep knowing I'm not going to miss anything because I've watched it over and over again. <laughs> well, what I do is actually I set I set a half hour timer so it turns off after half an hour. Oh, smart. And then the next day I skip back to where I remember oh. and I listen to the extra episode. So it's and that's this when you take thing. your nap. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> so I hear it all. I hear all of it. But in a way, it, yeah, I guess it is comforting. And I'm sure there is something psychological to the fact that when you have something every, I remember thinking. I'm in your brain, brain, yeah. brain, brain. You're, you are like the devil. <laughs> but so I have this intense thing. And then so meeting you was really natural, really cool. And at the same time, super surreal. Because I hear your voice, but it's coming out of you and not a headphone system. And there's a certain, like, it's different because when you've got a microphone, you talk differently as well. And and that sort of went okay <laughs> when we met on Friday. Yes. And then yesterday when I was in the studio, you were doing other shows. I remember Keith asked me a question 
And it was like, this is not how podcasts work. <laughs> I'm like, am I supposed to jump in? Like, what is this? <laughs> it's almost like you, ex- like I expected to come in and just be invisible and mm-hmm. watch the watch the show go on. And I'll be like, oh, I can remember what it was like because I was in the room. But then people start talking to you like, <laughs> and you think, well, this is. And and I'm sure that if any of the Keith and the Girl fans come over to listen to this episode, they're going to be jealous. I'm not telling anywhere where the, anyone where the studio is. <laughs> you I, should sell sell the address. <laughs> I told Andrea I, I I had this weird um, feeling coming across uh, off the subway. Um, I'm like I've got to forget which subway where I ate lunch, <laughs> what the name of the street is. I'm like, because I, I didn't want to, for whatever reason, <laughs> have it in my brain when I hit on the microphone. Mm-hmm. That I go, oh, yesterday I ate a, and then everybody knows where you are. Yeah, you wouldn't be the first. And um, one of our, uh, one of the people who works with us has sent the address to a bunch of uh, our supporters by accident <laughs> because it was included in a mailer. Oh, wow. And you know what? At Did this- anyone turn up? People have turned up in the past just finding us. Um, we try I, not to allow that to happen. Has that happened in this studio? Because it, I know someone came to your house when you were sh- when you were recording out of your house. No, it happened. It happened in the house, and now I think I think, and I don't want to just jinx this or anything, but I think we make it clear we'll invite that's you. Weird. You know yeah. what I mean? Like it, it, it'll be cool, and it's cool, and we're not trying to make this some secret club. We're just trying to sure. keep safe. Um, and you well, know, if and you there's have... work going on. Like this is yeah. one. This is one of the things that you do here. I, I'm sure you've heard for ten years. You know, you work one hour a day. <laughs> but but even for people <laughs> like me, I know that you don't work one hour a day. But I still don't see the before and after. So when I was here yesterday, I'm like, it's working. I'm like, wow, they, you know, they really are doing stuff. Like that's so funny. Yesterday, I was like, I knew I wouldn't be able to get stuff done. There's too many people, <laughs> <laughs> and it's and it's. It, it's not a bad thing. I just know those days are pretty hectic. Sure. Yeah. People coming and going. <laughs> and I feel guilty. I'm like, did I do enough stuff? Well, even even Andrea working in the corner is is doing stuff that needs to be done immediately after the show is recorded. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot, you know, there's a lot going on. And this is why I say that the studio is way better than my studio, which is like <laughs> microphones that I put in a backpack and take it wherever I need to go. Um I I wanted to ask you about that when you meet fans like how do you how do you how do you feel about that is it is it gratitude is it is it just being open because you're an open person what what what's the feeling you get when you have a conversation with someone that knows you so well Okay so years ago this would have made me very uncomfortable I would have had to convince you that I'm no different than you and mm-hmm. blah 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 and all this shit now I know and sure. you, I know that you know and that I know that I'm no different than you. But yeah. you're asking me a sincere question of an actual experience. So the first thing I had to do was get over the fact that, like, I was even being addressed that way. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, it's your average person doesn't necessarily get a question of, like, how does it feel when people meet you? Mm. Yeah, <laughs> do you know sure. what I mean? And so in my head, I'm just like, what are you talking about? But I had to. I think people have that dream of of fame almost like. They kind of want to be in a position where people are going to be nervous to meet them. Yeah, and I understand that. But, you know, once you're, it, it's not like I'm famous. A lot of mm. people who are going to listen to your show are going to, who the f- what, <laughs> what are you even talking about? But in my little microcosm, in my tiny world, I am a tiny celebrity. So, okay. to, so sometimes I've, I've come across where, I'm with a friend or with someone and somebody recognizes me. And then when that person leaves, the person I was already with says, are you famous? And I'm like, well, <laughs> well, no, not if you have to ask me that. Yeah, Do you know what I exactly. mean? Exactly. And so, but at the same time, they didn't have that experience with somebody recognizes them and asks for their autograph or something weird like that. Sure. So that's, that's the first thing I had to acknowledge that. The second thing is I had to ask myself, how, I, how do I feel about that? Because there is that, do I desire being above everybody and having someone come nervously ask me about mm. that? Luckily, no. <laughs> <laughs> what I do like about it is that I know if you're, if you're acting that way, that means that you've listened for a while. I totally get why I would feel weird. And it is my job to make you feel comfortable mm-hmm. because... Which you're very good at. Oh, good. I'm really glad because... I, I wonder actually because Keith is very obviously, despite how in every recorded medium he seems, he's a quiet, shy type is the feeling I get. 
Yeah. He's very funny. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like seeing Keith on, actually seeing Keith on the live show last Friday, you start realizing that he, he just talks funny. In a, you know what I mean? Yeah. He, he does actually talk funny. Like this is the thing. He does have the speech impediment thing. <laughs> but he talks funny in that you're almost listening and you're like, wait, that wasn't a punchline, but it was funny. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the feeling I get also listening to the show and it's the feeling I get hanging out with him. But when the microphones aren't on, even, even when we were out at the TBS, what's the New York Comedy Festival? Mm-hmm. You were talking to producers, you were doing all that, and he kind of keeps his distance. Yeah. Do you, do you think, is that just a personality thing or is it about you actually taking the active role as producer? I think it's a personality thing. I think what we ended up figuring out is that we took on the roles that we want. And so when we're mad at our own roles, that's too bad. You know, and so when production, I, I do do that end of production when that's too much for me, I realize that like, so what? It's an off day. But um, I am more in that. And he's more in the digital and correcting grammar. And he's very, in in a lot of cases, detail oriented. And I I am very social and maybe bigger picture. But we we divide up the work like that. And he doesn't he doesn't feel comfortable doing that stuff. Mm. He can. He sure. can, and he can also, and he'll be very comfortable. He's not uncomfortable talking to people. No, and he's very kind. Just to be, yeah. like, to be clear, it's not, it's not standoffish. But it's he's just more quiet. He's more stoic. Mm. And I, I live for this. So I had to recently, in my own brain, I decided that I have to find out what I want to do and and why why I do Keith and the girl because Keith and the girl was having me frustrated for a minute, and I'm just like, is this what I want to do, or do I just? keep doing it because this is what I do. This is just what I do now. And I and when I thought about it, I go, okay, I'm doing this. Why am I doing this? And I'm doing it because I want to build community because I want, I do want people coming up to me who already know me and let's be friends. And so um, to me, doing shows is what I want to do. Like, it's funny because my brother Michael works with us and he, when he asks me what I want to do, I want to do more live shows. I want to be in front of a uh in front of people, I want to meet more people. And he's like, you do five to 10 episodes a week and your fantasy is to do shows. Like mm. that's so, and, and, I, and I realized I do. I want, to, I want to create a space where not only other people can meet each other because they're here for whatever reason I've created, if that's me doing a live show or a game show or whatever, I will get the thing that gets people together, whether that means I have to put on a performance or or produce some sort of thing where everyone gets together to go camping or everything like that. My whole life is set up for people to meet other people and for me to meet them too and for us to exchange ideas. And when you say I'm different 12 years ago, it's because so many different kinds of people came into my studio, told me their experience, and I told them mine, and we had to learn and grow because otherwise you're not listening. Sure. That's what I want out of this. I want to meet you. I want to meet other people. I want I want you to meet someone else through my show and have a baby and like tell that story, you know, and and we're getting stories like that. And I am so satisfied. <laughs> you know, you, I had a, I had a theory on it, which is slightly different to, to how you've just put it, but I, I wonder what you think about it. When the show started, one of the reasons of you being the girl, uh, you know, the name aside, mm-hmm. one of the reasons was, was really that it was almost a supportive role. Keith wanted to do it and, he, and said, I don't want to do it by myself. Will you do it with me? I think it was 100% a supportive role. Do you think that in those first few years, you took on the producer role almost to kind of deliberate? Like he takes this, he's, he's in a sense the, the host. No, we didn't, so. nothing was deliberate. Because now I feel like it's, now I feel like you're equally co- co-hosts in terms of how much each one talks, how much each one brings yeah. to the show. You're much funnier after 10 years, like a lot Thank funnier. Um, which could be that you were funny before and didn't talk as much, or it could be that you hang out with comedians all week and everybody gets funnier in that, in that way. But I wondered whether in those early, early years it was about, about taking on a role outside of the show because you were a bit skeptical about being necessarily on the show no i just i just saw that people were were responding so i'm like let's then let's go meet these people let's see if they come out let's let's um you know there are people going 
uh, we're listening to your show every day. Let's go see if they'll they'll come to this thing, you mm-hmm. know, and and then we can do more. Uh, and it had nothing to do with money because our first show was free, our first live show. So it was just let's just do it. And I I became that. The reason if I if I'm funnier and God I hope I am and it sounds like I am. Thank you very much. See <laughs> this I have to learn how to just go. Oh thanks for yeah thanks for telling me I'm funnier. Here's yeah. how I got funnier <laughs> without sounding obnoxious. But uh, I think Keith is very funny and was um, completely balls out with it. Sure. And so I learned that, like, just say it. Just say it if it drops, whatever. Mm. Um, I was always scared that my parents would find the show. And so I always sort of self-edited by mistake. I was always afraid. I didn't think I was because I thought I was saying everything on my mind. But as soon as, like, one last argument happened with my parents and one more good conversation that happened out of truth happened, there was a shift where I'm like, that's it. Mm. That's it. I am going to come from whatever funny comes from me instead of worrying about will I offend people because I'm not an offensive person, although I can offend you. Does sure. that make sense? Sure. I will talk about sex, and if you don't want to hear about sex, and my my parents-in-law listen to this show sometimes, and they mm. don't want to hear about my sex life, they turn it off or down, yeah. and then they raise it back up when it's when it's not that. And I don't sure. ag- they don't agree with my politics and they hear it. And you know, so as far as I'm concerned, my intentions are good. I'm gonna have to be a little more ballsy with it. Yeah. I know what you mean. I think um speaking of I kind of wanted to talk about that idea of living living out, let's say. So living with an energy that consistently goes towards the people you meet. Yeah. Um one thing that it's I can yeah. see today, but I saw yesterday. Uh, Hemda has a big scar down the middle of her chest. Oh yeah, um, and across the which boob. which a lot of people would cover up. And um, this is something that you went through, and something that people who listen to you, in a sense, went through. Like I remember hearing the first time about you being worried, and and it's not the first occasion. There was an episode early on with fighting about. Keith's alcohol very early on, which was uncomfortable if you had been listening to that point because it was like, no, no, don't fight. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like mommy and daddy are fighting, stop mm-hmm. it. We've had a lot of mommy and daddy are fighting. Yeah. yeah. Even though we're not together. Sure. Mm-hmm. And then the then the finding out that you'd been broken up was a, a kind of similar moment. Um, this diagnosis was kind of that because it happened in real time. Mm-hmm. It's not just, oh, by the way, a week ago I was at the doctor and it was, oh, I'm going to find out what it is. Mm -hmm. And it was nerve wracking, which is weird in a sense. It's like, well, how do you know this? Like if someone were to ask, well, how do you know this person? It's hard to say, well, I listen. Because you can't even say, well, I I listen to her on the radio. Mm -hmm. Because it's not the same interaction in a podcast as on the radio. You can listen to a radio drive time show for 20 years and not feel connected with the hosts whatsoever. Not just because of their vulnerability, but because podcasts have a certain intimacy to them. So walk me through, it was a year ago now, right? Mm -hmm. Walk me through this, uh, or the the origin story of your massive scar. (laughs) Okay. Uh, The massive scar is from open heart surgery to remove, I believe it was a four pound tumor that was pushing on my lung so hard that I wasn't using that side. And it pushed on my heart in the other way, uh, where my heart was in a totally different place and still functioning somehow. How did you... It was by my shoulder. How did you know you needed to go and see someone? So I... I've had this tumor for years and didn't know. Last year I was running, which I'm not a runner, but I do it sometimes for exercise. We have this like fake running club <laughs> and we're just running two miles today. I think you're, I think you're minimizing. How often do you go running? I don't, the last time I went was a couple weeks ago for like okay. two miles or so something. Maybe, you, maybe you've dropped down because I remember you running pretty I, regularly. I go through phases. Well, because I was, I'm, I'm biking now. Okay. So that replaced it. Right. Okay. Uh, so I was running two miles, and I've always run terribly, you know, but I mm. did it because it, it's very good, like, slimming down, you know. You, you know what running does. <laughs> <laughs> You've heard of running, right, listeners? Have you heard of running? <laughs> Wikipedia.org slash running. So, uh, so I'm jogging. and <laughs> <laughs> Jogging is also on Wikipedia if you need to look into it. It's like running, but slower. But more accurate for what I do. Sure. Uh, and this is the first time while I was running – I was like, oh my God, 
I'm wheezing. I can't breathe. Um, and that's happened some sort. And I'm, but there was always a reason. Like, it's raining. It's harder to breathe in sure. this fog or whatever. A reason or an excuse to not listen to your body. <laughs> yes. Sure. And also, you, you hear me. I'm a bad runner. Of course, I'm wheezing. Do mm. you know what I mean? It, easy to just shoo it all away. Um, but I'm not in like the worst shape. So I couldn't get it for the first time ever in my life. I said, let me find a shortcut. I always finished a run that I said I would do, whether I walked it at the end or whatever. For the first time I came back, I, I did two shows after that. And you hear me coughing and wheezing on the show. Mm. Uh, Mateo Lane was on that show and he happened to come back the Monday after this. So weekend passed in, in that weekend, that day after that show, I was so tired and so out of it, which is not usual. And I was wheezing and I was coughing and I called up um, my insurance to say, hey, can you send me um, this thing for my wheeze? They've, I've done it before. I forget what it's called. And I'll, it's sort of like an inhaler, mm -hmm. maybe a little more intense. Can you just send that to me and, uh, and I'll get better? And, and they were on the phone and they do that. They were on the phone going, no, you sound fucked up. Mm. You got to go to the hospital right now. And I'm telling you the story this way, but what they were really hearing is, <gasps> Sure. I'm fine. <laughs> I just need an inhaler. Mm. <laughs> and I, I don't have asthma or anything. They go, if you don't go to the hospital right now, and we're going to check on you. So get yourself mm. over to the hospital right now. And I'm like, fucking drama queens. Okay. <laughs> I get a cab. You know, I'm not calling an ambulance. I'm not paying for that. I get a cab. While I'm on the way, they call me. They're like, are you on the way to the hospital? Wow. What is this new program? <laughs> Yes, I'm on the way to the hospital. Everything's fine. Uh, they do give me that medicine that I asked for. My wheezing goes away. I'm fine. I think it's great. The doctor says, we're going to give you an x-ray just to feel better. They come back. There's a look on their face <laughs> that I'm like, wow, you think you're hiding something, but your poker face is yeah. terrible. And that's terrifying because I know that you've given bad news. And they said, there's a mass that's this big and blah, blah, blah. And they looked at me and they said, you've never... because." They said, you've never gotten an x-ray before because they were floored that but I'm standing there. They're yeah. floored that I even tried running. I shouldn't be able to breathe. And so then, what's in your head there? Just cancer? Is that what comes to mind? I didn't really fully understand what a mass was. Okay. I knew that there was something alien in my body and I knew I would have to deal with it. So I am crying. My husband's crying. Sure. I knew that no matter what, there's an invasion. So I didn't, I tried not to think ahead, uh, but I knew... You know, you start thinking, like, how much time am I going to have to take off for this? Like, how am I going to manage this? Thank God I have insurance. Uh, how long did I leave this? Mm. You know, right away they started talking about chemo, radiation, uh, you know, and, and you've watched other people go through it. And it's like, okay, fine. The biggest thing that was in my head that scared me is just tell me if I'm going to die after this. Mm. Because I just kind of want to know if I need to go through all of this if I'm going to die. And then I said, oh, my God, yeah, clearly I could die from this based on the looks in their faces and how serious this is and how much I wasn't supposed to be standing around. Like mm. the rarity of this disease, the rarity of, of being, of, of letting it go this long when you have this disease, you know, all that stuff started coming in and I thought, okay, I can die. Let's say I die and I was 40 at the time or about to turn 40. I know I was 40 at the time. And I started looking back on my life and I was like, okay, I'm good to go. Mm. Like, I felt so satisfied and so good at that, that I was given the opportunity to go. If you die now, because it is a possibility, it's a genuine possibility right now, are you good? And I went back and I looked and I said, I spent time pursuing singing. I spent time pursuing comedy. I spent time pursuing the truth. And I spent time doing, like answering the questions of my life truthfully and aiming towards that. And I, I never got rich, uh, but I, I pretty much did what I wanted as much as I could and followed a path that I'm really, really satisfied with. And I was like, I'm ready to die. <laughs> and not in a morbid way. No, but what's... How does your husband react when you say, look, I'm ready? <laughs> that's when I my heart breaks it's like sure. I can die all I want it's it's not the dying person who's dealing with it it's the people around who you leave behind mm. 
And I started noticing things like that come in. My brother's away. You know, Andrew is in San Francisco with his family. And Michael has his own shit to deal with, you know, and he's here. And um, I have I have to run a company and people are relying on me. And my husband and I just got married. Sure. And one of the first things I said was, I'm really sorry that you just married into this and what you have to go through. <laughs> and what he said, and this is separately to the same person in an interview that, you know, Libby interviewed us separately. And, and he said, I'm so glad that I'm married to her now because um, now we can deal with it together. And so separately we said that, and I had to get over the fact that like, I'm not burdening people, you know, I have to, I have to just go through this and he has to go through it also. But our marriage did without realizing it, it, it increased in challenges that we later had to deal with afterwards because we were so busy dealing with, are you going to die? Mm. So, so some of the stuff we had to put, we had to put his feelings and my feelings aside a lot. Sure. And then, you know, that kind of stuff surfaces up afterwards. Something I haven't, haven't said in this medium is that uh, my mother passed away five years ago from non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, or in a way, uh, from. And I say that because uh, what actually happened is she was, she was given an option to take a, an operation where the mortality rate was very high. And she said, okay, we, we have to do it. It's the last option. It's that or chemo forever and who knows. Mm. And and the survival rate, if I recall correctly, was given at 40%. And, and they said, you may not get off the operating table. And if you do, you may have an infection. And if you get past that, you may get cancer again. Right. And... She resigned to it by the time the operation came around. Mm. But before that, I remember when, when we got that news, that the news that that was the option was the killer. Because what do you do? Do you say, well, you can't do something that might kill you when the other option is it might kill you anyway. And I, I broke down. And I was in, I was in Italy and this is one of the saddest things for me. I was in Italy and I had a flight booked for two weeks after her operation. Mm -hmm. And she said, and I said, look, you know, I'm going to change my flight. I'm going to come home. If you're going to do it now, I'm going to come home. And she said, look, they've explained it to me. They've said... You're going to have the operation and then you're going to be drugged up and you're not going to know what's going on for two weeks. And she had had another operation in which she was a month in the hospital and asleep 95% of the time. And she said, it's just like that. So she said, you're going to come home and I'm not going to know you're there. And she was, she said, I'm really proud of everything. And you're there doing what you want to do. And I'm proud of that. And I don't want to stand, stand in the way of that. And I'm thinking it's two weeks. Like, like I've done it. <laughs> I'm, I'm cool. I'm fine. And she's like, don't worry about it. I'm going to do the operation. You'll come home two weeks later when I'm really waking up. And, and it'll be fine. Then it was five o'clock in the morning in Italy. And I got a call saying, she's had the operation, it's totally fine, but, and it was that she had taken some form of infection. And they said, we don't know. And we're sort of between Italy and Australia booking flights home for that day. And I was in the countryside of Tuscany, nowhere near an airport. It took five hours to get to the airport. I'll just kill her. I finally got to the airport, so at five o'clock I'm packing bags because I never expected to leave that day. I'm in an apartment with all my stuff out. I'm packing bags at five o'clock in the morning. And in a car an hour later towards a train station, then on a train, then to the airport. Then I'm in a plane for 16 hours 
because Italy to Australia is not <laughs> close. And I'm talking to the woman next to me, and all I can think is, I, d- I don't, I don't even know. I don't, I don't know if she'll be there. Truly, the worst part is yeah. not knowing. It was in between the finding it and the telling me what it is and what the actions are, and that was the worst part, the not knowing the future, the letting go of the future, the Mm. letting go that you have any say in any of this anymore. You are not going to operate on anybody. You are not going to be the healer of anybody. You didn't cause this. You can't cure it. You can't do anything. So you got to live in that and start joking about it. And even (laughs) even the people around you have to realize, you know? Yeah. Um. For for me, I I got to Dubai, which was the the layover, and and I checked in, and they said she's she's you know still here. We're we're doing everything we can to to keep her here. And then I did another ten hours of the flight. And it's a killer when they say turn off your phone. Yeah, mm-hmm. and and it wouldn't work anyway. I'm like, right. and what am I thinking? And, and what are you thinking when you turn on your phone when you get? Exactly. When you land, you got to turn it on to a message. I turned it on. My sister was there and I knew immediately. And, and they said, we tried, but we couldn't keep her any longer. And it's such a sad thing for me. Cause I just kind of like, why didn't I take a flight a day before, you know? And then you blame yourself forever. And she never would blame me. Never. But you just go, well, like how egotistical am I in Europe, you know, just sort of living the life. I, you know, I didn't have to be there that day. Well, your mom gave you an order to not come. <sighs> yeah. And then I, I soon realized that in that order to not come, that conversation was a phone call that she made to every single one of her six kids, telling every single one how much she loved them, how much they mattered, and that she was proud of them. And she knew. But she didn't make it. She didn't make it out. Like it didn't sound like that. It didn't sound like that until she was gone, and I re- I looked back. It sounded like every other conversation. But she said everything she needed to say. And I think she, you know, we were talking about the panic of, will I die? I think she had gotten past that panic. Because you have it every day. What like what do you do if every day is will I die tomorrow? It's not. It doesn't become that. It, it's. It's a choice, it's a rough choice. And I think some people who have a diagnosis right now are can shake a fist at me of mm-hmm. telling them that there's a choice and I chose that this is, if this is gonna kill me, that's fine. Sure. And if this is going to change my life, that's fine, wherever it goes. And if this is going to, whatever it does to me, mm-hmm. it's it's gonna be okay and I'm gonna just, do whatever I can. I'm not saying that I was a bundle of joy the whole time, but my biggest fear was becoming a bad patient because sure. it's hard. You know, you're in the hospital, you're getting like needles every day and you're getting, um, you know, people want to visit you, but you're not always in the mood. Yeah. And people want to help you, you're not always in the mood, but you're forced because you're on the ground. Sure. Literally, I couldn't sit up. So I needed help at every turn. And it's very humbling and it's mm. beautiful. And what I got, what I really got, and I think your mom got this too, is I got to go to my own funeral. Mm. So I wasn't the only one who thought that I was going to die. As soon as people, you know, people on the show, I, it's like you said, I said it in real time. I yeah. would go to the doctor and I would literally get here. I mean, the doctors took forever. <laughs> you could just lose your job over this. I felt very lucky to have this job where I go to the job. By the time I come here, the on-air sign is on. You know, I got to do the other work some other time. Sure. And I go, I just came from the doctor. This is what he said, you know, and then I got comedians laughing at me, Mm. (laughs) you know, Uh, just, and I got the doctors laughing at me because I would ask, I would ask questions, you know, the comedians would go, uh, hey, do you have the kind with teeth? And I'm like, you know, I didn't bother asking. They're like, put that on your list. I made a list of people, you know, asking me, I would ask them if it had teeth and hair and the doctor didn't even know where I came up with this from. And I'm just like, well, we're not going to laugh about this. Sure. Um, well, it is about, yeah, having to deal with the same thing every day either either forces you to break down or figure out how to deal with it. You yeah, know? But, but if you pay it, if you, I was very lucky. 
everyone that thought I was going to die started writing me letters. So I got to hear my own eulogy. I got mm. to hear what, what I did for people. And it's only going to be positive because I'm about to die, right? Sure. So it was the most beautiful thing that I started producing people's funerals in my head. Like, because hmm. we all need this. And it's, I got my, so my lucky. Ma- my mother planned her entire funeral. She said, she said explicitly what she didn't want. She said, but more than, more than anything, she said, I want lots of bright colors. I don't want any black. I don't want people to be sad. I and the, the song she chose to finish the funeral was "Feeling Good" by Nina Simone. You One know, of my favorite songs of all time. Which is amazing, but for those that don't know it, is about you know about looking around the world and going, everything is amazing, and therefore I am feeling good. You know, ooh, and so that song. Ooh, and I'm feeling good. It's good to hear your voice again. <laughs> I haven't heard you sing in quite a while, but it. It's interesting that, so we've been very clear about earlier when we were talking about not saying that you had cancer, (laughs) because this comes together, you know. What exactly is the name of of what you do have? Uh, I have thymoma. There's a thymus on the top of your chest. Um, Mm -hmm. And when you're 18, it's supposed to go away. And if it grows, it's bad. Okay. And so um, it it can, I think it can only grow into a tumor. so that, and because of that, it was pushing my esophagus. Because of the operation, they had to um, take out a nerve, and now my um, my diaphragm is not working. Uh, it's paralyzed. And I have myasthenia gravis, which is a neurological um, uh, muscle disease. So sometimes my muscles, uh, I guess, atrophy. Sometimes, yeah. like, I just don't have... Are the two related? Yeah, so okay. a lot of times, like, they definitely check for myasthenia gravis when you have thymoma, and that, is, you know, sometimes you won't have feeling in your legs. Some people have to walk with a cane. Um, it's it's usually pretty harsh, but I think weed helps mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, lucky that you can get it. Well, I got it when it was illegal. I got it illegally. Sure. I have it legally now, but fuck, fuck everyone. <laughs> weed should be, I mean, I this is part of part of why I I... I resent what people think about weed and what they made me think about weed, that it's just this stony drug for losers and, you know, weak people where I've been running a business on it now for quite some time. Mm. And and it really has helped me get through a lot of things. Without taking us <laughs> I down. Know, I can go so far in that. <laughs> well, and also I don't want to take us down to the path of tears again because <laughs> we got pretty close or even really got there. You are, let's say that you're estranged from your parents. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, they also live in another country. Yes. What's, and and this was well decided and well well known to you before you got the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. What's what's the reaction when you realize that they're going to find out, they're going to have to find out sometime whether you tell them or someone else is going to tell them. Do you think, well, I'm going to go back on it, I'm going to call. Do you think, no, I'm resolute. Oh, that was scary. I don't know, because I knew my mother would call me. Mm-hmm. I don't know about my dad, but and they're still together. And I thought, will I pick it up? Is this fair not to pick it up? Because it's your child, even though you're not talking, this is your child who's getting cut open. Open heart surgery for a 40-year-old that was the youngest person on the floor. You know, sure. it, it's it's strange. But um, that went bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, they were on vacation while I was in the hospital, uh, my mother didn't know while she was on vacation. My dad did, but he doesn't really know how to deal with his feelings. And they didn't really know how to deal with it. So by the time my mother knew, and here's the thing, my brother had a second baby. Andrew had a second baby while I was in the hospital. Hmm. And so they came from Israel to the United States to see the baby. Sure. And they left without seeing me. And so I don't know if I gave my mom a chance to to see me or not. I don't remember the timing of it, but... I don't know how to navigate that. It's, okay. a, it's a very difficult thing because... Does I, that hit you when they leave? Does, does it throw you down? The worst thing is that it hits me constantly. Is okay. that I'm like, I have grown to like get over it a lot more than I used to. But, you know, it's it's your parents. So you kind of fall into... I, I fall into a feeling like, wow, that's really sad every once in a while. And yeah, when, when I needed mommy <laughs> and it would have been nice... Mm. I I have to understand that that's not that's not really available. 
Mm -hmm. but not just for me and not just because of my mom. My mom's great. My dad's great. They did a lot, but you can't just because you're sick, excuse me, you can't just because you're sick, ask somebody else to be a different human being who mm -hmm. responds to you differently. And it's one of the things that I had to really make sure that I can't decide that my parents are going to very specifically love me in the way that I want or need just because I'm sick in the yeah. same way that I can't love them the way they want and need because they're sick, mm -hmm. because our minds are sick. One of us, we're both probably right. We're both probably angry for no reason. Sure. We're both probably going through it. And I, so I go through waves of like, I went through an angry phase, you know, like you can come all the way from another country to see a newborn baby who's not going to remember you and who gives a shit they have enough help mm. while I'm in the hospital, I could easily start feeling bad for sure. myself. But my father had cancer. He had to, you know, open his thing mm. up. I'm, I'm having similar things as his, you know. He went through it. I wasn't there at his sure. hands and feet fixing him. He's got a wife. I have a husband. And people live their own lives. So is there a point where you have to decide or you have to think, okay, I've made a decision to not be in touch. I've made a decision to not keep the door so open. Maybe I need to let that go for now because I'm sick. Uh, yes, I thought of that, but I thought of it. There's too much going on for me to make any major decisions that didn't get pushed my way. And because they didn't push this time, I didn't, I didn't have to make it. She called twice. I ignored it twice or I missed it once and ignored it once and I and then she didn't give me the option anymore, which I thought was fine. Whether she was being merciful or I was, or that's just what they want right now. I don't know what they want. They want a daughter that doesn't exist and I can't give them that. So it doesn't matter if I'm sick. Mm. But recently I've been like, they should really know, even though I'm not talking to them, they should know how great they did. They should know, mm. my mother should know that she is a wonderful mother until you hit puberty. <laughs> how, how do you get that message through to them? <laughs> I wrote an email that I haven't sent. I okay. I am now, I'm, I'm in Al-Anon as I've been for a while and I'm, I'm about to go through the steps. And in the steps you write an inventory. And I think, you know, I happen to be doing it in Al-Anon. I can do it with a therapist. I'm about to see a therapist too, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm going to write down my grievances and would it be smart if I, and I'll, I'll write it all out and I'll approach it from wherever I am when I'm done with that. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because right now I do want to, I, I just want to get in touch and go, you know what, you're great. And if you die tomorrow, you should know that you really did your best and whatever your, whatever I would, I'm dissatisfied with is, is, is probably unfair, even if it is fair, because mm. I got a great childhood. Everyone has problems. So that's okay. It's, um, I really could, I, I could sit and talk with you for hours. <laughs> like, and, and we went and had coffee before and it's, you, you know, I count heaven to now and as just, as a friend, as much as, it's weird that I know you so well. Um, it's beautiful. But we've had, a, like, we've had a nice connection and it could have been much more awkward, I'm sure. And may, maybe that's partly me. Maybe it's totally you. I'm not sure. Oh, I've made things plenty awkward in my day. Yeah. Every, everyone gets their turn to make it awkward. To, for the fact that we, we do have to get out of the studio because it's so consistently in use and, and it's going to be um, used immediately after we get out. I'll bring things full circle, which is when I met Hamda in New York for the first time, it was, it was weird because we were going to the same place and she was on the escalator ahead of me and I was like oh that's her and I'm like I hope she doesn't see me because then I have to say hi immediately and I'm not ready <laughs> I'm not ready right and I was I was with Emily and I said Emily I that's her and I don't know what to do and and she said okay okay oh that's that's her oh, that's interesting this whole thing right then we get to the top of the escalator I'm like it's okay she's she's ahead she'll go in and you get in the elevator and I'm like we have to take that elevator <laughs> So I go into the elevator. I'm like, hi, I'm Sam. I'm like, we're just going to do this. And she said, hi, how are you? And I said, oh, you know, I'm a bit jet lagged, but that's just a, that's a deal I, I got in yesterday. And the response is something I'll remember forever, which I think is really interesting <laughs> in, well, for the people that can hear the sadness in, in your voice in all this other stuff, it's really interesting to hear the energy that comes out of you a year later. She said, 
well, that's not good enough. It's now my personal mission to pump you up. No more jet lag. <laughs> And just such, and I was like, I do feel better, you know. Like it <laughs> I just, just had to yell at you. A it was bit. suddenly that, you know. And then, and then the next thing I I know, you're throwing out um, merchandise and stuff, which sadly I didn't catch. Oh, was, we have plenty here. You got to take some I'm before just gonna you go. Steal some out of the store. Good. Don't tell anybody. But and and now I know, and this is an energy that I've got with you when I saw you again yesterday, and even today. It's just, it really is. It's it's so we're talking about these corny things again. It's like oh yeah, she went through this and now she's a real go getter. <laughs> and I'm sure it's not just that, but it's it's in a sense it's like it's like seeing you bounce back even before maybe you're completely ready. You know, you still are looking after your house. You're still kind of finding your way. Yeah. But such a positive energy, um, which is where this is now where we plug. The fact that you do life coaching. <laughs> so if you, if you need someone who talks with you like she talked with me for an hour and uh, <laughs> and makes you feel you know super pumped up for the rest of your life, well, get in touch. In that in that vein, I really believe like it's so funny because uh, <laughs> behind the scenes shit, I've heard you tell the story of me telling you to get over your jet lag <laughs> a couple of times, and it's always funny what what sticks with people, and I love it, and. I have gotten like thanks for bringing positive energy and things like that. And the thing is, is I really, really believe that if you can hear this show, then that means you've got enough privilege that your life is good. Yeah. Right. No matter what, your mother、sure. could have cancer. She could have just died yesterday. You could have just found out that you have a deadly disease. It is very much in you and very difficult at times to come with positive energy and to come with like this belief that honestly. Purely, honestly, everything will be okay because it is okay, and I do think we need reminders, which is why we go to therapy and why we socialize. And I do think that it is very important to have a handful of things to go to when you start sliding down that negativity. Because I, I have been depressed. I am a depressive person. I, I do get somewhat manic and energetic, and I have a lot of energy. But I have come to like it, just live in gratitude. Serious, everybody who's if you just want to do it just for your own success. Every successful person, if they if you ask them what attributes their like what what kind of attributes can lead to success, live in gratitude. Tony Robbins, Gary Vaynerchuk,、uh, probably Jesus Christ.、Mm-hmm. You know, like everyone says, wake up in the morning and that thing that you feel right away. Where, oh, I gotta face this day. Oh, I gotta go to work. Stop it. Stop, and I know it's hard, and I know that sometimes you will need medication to do that, and that's、mm. fine too. But if you are finding yourself do that, this is just one trick. As soon as you wake up, tell your brain to stop because you do have that power. Because you're listening to me now, you have that power. Just go. I'm not. I'm just gonna thank myself, the universe, whoever, for something first thing in the morning, and for something before I go to sleep at night. And I promise you, your life will get better. Corny again? Wow! But I promise you. I'm just thinking, how am I going to follow this up? <laughs> we finish. We finish with this, and I've got. I've got. Well, thanks for coming. It's nice to meet you. <laughs> and by the way, I don't cover that scar. I never did cover that scar. It's. It's. I see it's people looking at today. it. It's not covered today. It's not covered. It's just that she has a. a I have a shirt on. A shirt on. <laughs> <laughs> I had a shirt on yesterday, but shirts are different. Yeah. But I. I never wanted to cut co- to cover it because I never wanted to uncover it. It's not anything.、Sure. It's a scar. Ask me about it. I had open heart surgery. That is incredible. <laughs> it's in my. Tit was on my shoulder while people were bugging into my heart. I mean, look at my scar. It's <laughs> magic. It's it's wow,、mm. wow. I should have died, but they were able to open me up and put me back together. And all I have is a scar. Look at my scar. Photograph it. Enlarge、sure. it and put it on top of you. And just know that's not the thing that's ever gonna bug me. I will take scars all over my body. I'm. I'm just sitting here.、Mm. There was a tumor in my heart, and you oh, you took a knife to me. Wow! Come on, come on. This is miraculous. It's huge. It's ginormous. Y- you can't. You can't be sad. You can't. I, I, re- <laughs> I refuse. I, I refuse. refuse. <laughs> I think that's good. I refuse to be sad. Yes, I refuse. And、you、sometimes can't... I actually do have to refuse. I go, oh my god, I'm getting sad. No, refuse it. Refuse it. And not in a weird way where you're just stuffing down your feelings. Why am I sad? Is this real? Are my feelings fact? Can I get over this? 
What are the five things that I set up to do for myself? Do I need to go to a meeting? Do I need to meet a friend and cry? Do I need to sit here by myself and actually feel the negative feeling so I could push through it to the other side? But whatever it is, it's happening and it's fine. It's okay. Mm -hmm. It'll be okay because it is okay. It'll be okay because it is okay. Yes. I think that's Jerry's final thought for today. I think that works well. So if you, um, if you're the first for the first time hearing Hamda's voice, uh, the obvious choice is to go to keithandthegirl.com. Please subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, everything where you can find podcasts. You know where you can find good podcasts, like they say about good books. Where you can, anywhere you can find good books oh. is where the book sells. Oh you yes, that. Add you that. can find us anywhere that you find good podcasts. Ooh. And uh, I'm using your technique. You'll hear that now on Keith sure. and the Girl. And you're Hemder on twin Twitter. Yes. And Keith and the Girl on Facebook. And I just want to say thank you. Thank because you. This has been amazing in a completely unexpected but you know hopeful way. And I'm, you know, I can't say this is the best episode because there are other guests, but it's the best episode. Well, you are a delight. And this has been super easy and super wonderful. And I, I hope to meet more people like you. And I'm really happy that I met you. Thank you wow. so much for this. I really appreciate anybody who's interested in hearing me talk. <laughs> <laughs> And it all comes down to that. I've got it. Like, this is all, this was literally just to get more listeners. I'm into it. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is everyone's like, well, how do I? We've been podcasting for so long. People ask us, how do you get guests? How do I ask? And it's like, please, we want to talk all oh, the time. God. Get whoever you want. They'll say yes. Just ask people to talk. People are dying to talk. Okay, so now you all have to subscribe <laughs> because if this was all for nothing. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for listening. And uh, yeah, check out Hamda and we'll see you next time.